So for this talk, I'm going to address a topic of precision medicine and the treatment of muscle-invasive bladder cancer. Are we there yet? These are my disclosures, and I will be talking about a trial from QED Therapeutics that we currently have open, and um, I'll mention uh, the TCGA classifier that we developed as a result of the TCGA in, uh, project in muscle-invasive bladder cancer that I co-led. So these data are quite familiar with everybody, and um, it clearly shows that neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy improves the pathologic complete response rate uh, from radical cystectomy. There is little doubt, as you see a near tripling of the uh, PT0 rate in the chemotherapy plus cystectomy group versus cystectomy alone, and this is almost invariably seen just with cisplatin-based uh, multi-agent uh, chemotherapy. So SWOG 8710 was a randomized trial of uh, three cycles of neoadjuvant MVAC plus cystectomy versus cystectomy alone, and we can see quite clearly that in both arms, patients who were pathologic T0 with or without chemotherapy had a very good outcome as opposed to those patients that had residual muscle invasive cancer with or without um, chemotherapy. And until recently, there was no standard of care for uh, patients with residual muscle invasive cancer, but the approval of nivolumab just a couple of days ago in the adjuvant setting uh, has been a welcome uh, uh, change. We took a look within this patient population in a secondary analysis that was led by Guru Sanpavde and showed that patients who had residual uh, T1, TIS, or TA disease had an intermediate outcome compared to patients who were PT0 or had residual muscle invasive cancer. So these patients can actually do well in the long run uh, as well. So there have been a number of meta-analyses that all show something quite similar, that the absolute improvement in overall survival uh, ranges from about 5 to 10 percent. It's a little higher within that range for patients who had platinum-based uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and this is the aggregated Kappa-Meyer plot from that. And it is undeniable, and it is statistically significant, but arguably it's a small advantage uh, for patients treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Our guidelines are very consistent and strongly recommend uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy with cisplatin-based uh, multi-agent therapy for patients who are platinum eligible. This is a strong recommendation based upon high-level evidence from uh, two large randomized clinical trials, which you all are quite familiar with. It's, note, it's worth noting that the only regimens that have been tested in these trials are MVAC or CMV, and while GC, or gemcitabine cisplatin, is the, probably the most commonly used uh, regimen in this setting, it was established um, as in a non-inferiority trial uh, in patients with measurable metastatic disease compared to MVAC. So in my opinion, uh, MVAC or CMV remain the standard of care. But currently for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we're, we remain stuck in this one size uh, fits all. Though, as you'll see, I think the future is uh, bright. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about prognostic and predictive uh, biomarkers uh, and the idea of precision medicine, of course, is the right treatment for the individual patient. So in theory, if we had a biomarker or set of biomarkers that could reliably predict response to whether it be neoadjuvant chemotherapy or immunotherapy, we would ideally treat those patients whose tumors are primed to respond and try different therapy with those that are not or go straight to cystectomy. So this is uh, happened to be a friend of mine, a neighbor of mine uh, at the time, 70 years old, healthy, had a left nephro-ureterectomy six years previously for a pathologic T1 tumor. She'd also had a history of high-grade T1 in her bladder, treated with BCG induction and maintenance with a long disease-free interval of several years, and she recently presented with right upper quadrant pain. She had, as you can see on the CT, what appears to be obvious liver uh, metastasis that were fairly large volume. We biopsied this, and this showed urothelial cancer. She had a PET CT, which showed widespread metastatic disease. She was started on dose dense MVAC, which she didn't tolerate, never really recovered her performance status, and tragically was dead nine weeks after the onset of her pain. 
we sequenced the liver metastasis and identified an FGFR mutation, and she was low PDL1, suggesting that she may be a lower likelihood to have responded to immunotherapy. So this is the Tempus uh, uh, cancer gene panel, and you can see at the top she had an FGFR3 mutation as well as potentially other actionable uh, mutations, uh, notably KDM6A and CDKN2A. And she would have been a candidate potentially for ertafitinib, which is FDA approved for patients with FGFR3 mutations who fail uh, cisplatin-based uh, chemotherapy. So if you look in the TCGA uh, mutation heat map, what I've got highlighted here is that FGFR3 mutations were present in about 14% of patients and an additional 2% had uh, FGFR3 fusions, and the most common partner with that is TAC3. And these would all uh, in, uh, uh, constitutively activate um, uh, FGFR3 and uh, prime the tumor potentially to respond to an FGFR3 inhibitor, but we didn't know that until it was too late in this particular patient. So we're doing a clinical trial with QED, so I have funding for this from our local site, and uh, I'm also on the steering committee for this trial, which is called PROOF302. So this is uh, an adjuvant uh, therapy with their FGFR1 through 3 selective kinase inhibitor called infogratinib. And they've uh, looked at this in a uh, advanced patient population. That's the study design on the left. <clears throat> These are Kaplan-Meier plots looking at uh, uh, patients um, in two different uh, cohorts. And while the vast majority of the patients uh, recur uh, and die from their disease, uh, uh, there does appear to be a tail of the curve, which you can see in the far right. So QED has started an adjuvant trial for patients with high risk, predominantly upper tract uh, urinary, uh, excuse me, urothelial cancer of both the renal pelvis and the ureter, at least muscle invasive cancer. And we also are including patients with bladder cancer who meet the same criteria. And it's a randomization to infogratinib, the FGFR inhibitor and placebo. This trial is underway and it does require uh, sequencing of the tumor and identification of uh, an activating mutation in FGFR3 or a fusion. Um, so this still has a long way to go, but it's an exciting uh, uh, prospect for patients who have high-risk disease following neoadjuvant chemotherapy or uh, without uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So more to come on that as this trial evolves. So we did a trial in the Southwest Oncology Group that we called uh, COXIN. This was SWOG 1314. It was based on Dan Theorescu's work where he had identified a gene expression-based uh, uh, biomarker uh, that uh, was associated with response to chemotherapy and neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But this had never been tested uh, prospectively. There was a ton of retrospective data. And so we designed this trial as a biomarker validation study. So patients had to be candidates for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They had to be cisplatin eligible, and they were randomized uh, to either GEMSYS or dosedense MVAC. This was a randomized phase two. It was not intended to compare the two chemotherapy regimens, but rather we had a GC score and an MVAC score from this uh, COXIN algorithm. And it was designed to validate whether or not one or both of these scores, uh, expression-based scores, uh, could predict a high probability of PT0, in other words, uh, response to cisplatin-based chemotherapy, and there's a whole host of molecular analyses that went along with this. This was, uh, we completed enrollment now uh, almost uh, four years ago, and we've published the data, and I wanna show this to you because it's quite instructive. So only the GC score in the pooled treatment arms uh, was associated with uh, a major pathologic downstaging. So what you see here in the favorable score, a total of 65% of patients either were PT0 or downstaged as opposed to the unfavorable score, 48%. And then when you look at the GC score in terms of uh, the predictive properties in the combined arms, again, we're looking at total downstaging. Uh, there was a high specificity of 81%. Uh, though um, neither the positive predictive value or negative predictive value, in our opinion, was really high enough to take this into uh, a phase three trial where you would use coxin to select uh, therapy. So my point here is that 
uh, when we're looking at predictive uh, biomarkers, uh, validation is the key, prospective validation. Um, so what about uh, DNA damage repair gene alterations? So this is work that was done by Jagel Kim and the group at the Broad, and they reported on ERCC2 uh, mutations, which is the uh, top row in the heat map, um, and ERCC2 signature mutations, which I've got circled here. And if you look in the box where I've highlighted ERCC2 mutations in 13% and other nucleotide excision repair gene alterations of 18%, you can appreciate that upwards of a third of uh, tumors in this cohort uh, might be primed to respond to cisplatin-based uh, chemotherapy. So this was a very important paper uh, published by this group. Um, so then Ellie Van Ellen uh, did a very interesting study where he took two groups of patients, 25 each. Uh, the, in one group were patients who were PT0 after cisplatin-based chemotherapy, and the others were non-responders. And he did a discovery uh, project where he found that ERCC2 mutations were present only in the responder group and not in the non-responder group. And he looked at other uh, DNA repair gene alterations, which you can see in the gray on the right. So they then looked at this in a prospective phase two trial that they uh, performed using dose-dense uh, gemcitabine uh, uh, cisplatin neoadjuvant chemotherapy and found something quite similar, that the ERCC2 mutations were only observed in the responders versus the non-responders, and they also looked at a host of other DNA damage repair gene alterations. Betsy Plemak in the group at um, Fox Chase uh, took a look at this in their own phase two trials and identified a slightly different set of genes, uh, most notably ATM, uh, Fanconi anemia gene, and RB1, and uh, these were associated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy response. And then uh, finally, uh, a very bright uh, urologist, Quang Lee, uh, at, um, at Roswell Park uh, looked at uh, ERCC2 uh, mutations through a whole host of tumors and again identified bladder cancer as the highest, uh, uh, as the tumor with the highest percentage of ERCC2 mutations. So in aggregate, this would suggest that DNA, jam excuse me, DNA damage repair gene alterations and most notably ERCC2 uh, might be priming these tumors to respond to cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Again, this needs to be validated prospectively. So Gopa Iyer is the PI of a very important trial in the Alliance where they're doing just that. So patients who are getting GC neoadjuvant chemotherapy have their tumor sequenced using the MSK impact uh, cancer uh, panel, and they look at these uh, genes that are highlighted in the orange uh, box uh, in the bottom left. And if a patient has one or more of these uh, gene alterations and has a complete pathologic response, although they include CIS, they can go on to get bladder sparing without additional therapy. If they don't respond, then they get radical cystectomy. If they're wild type, in other words, we wouldn't think that they'd be primed to respond to GC in a, in an, as an exceptional responder, they can go on to get radical cystectomy or chemoradiation therapy. So if this trial is successful, it could be the first to establish the safety in a prospective fashion of treating patients who have DNA damage repair gene alterations or deleterious alterations with GC, and if they have a complete response, observing them if this is proven to be safe. So in the TCGA, this is the RNA-seq uh, unsupervised hierarchical clustering where we described five um, expression-based uh, subtypes, and these are, you're familiar with these, these are the luminal papillary, uh, luminal infiltrated, luminal, and then this large group of basal squamous tumors and neuronal uh, tumors. And these are each characterized by unique sets of um, uh, gene expression that I won't go into today. But we showed in the cell paper that these were prognostic, uh, with luminal papillary expecting, expectedly having the best prognosis and neuronal having the worst and the rest in between. So we proposed in a figure of this paper um, a, a strategy of how these subtypes might be used to direct uh, subtype-specific therapy. So for instance, in luminal papillary, which has a high uh, incidence of FGFR3 mutations, you might try an FGFR3 targeted agent. And because they have good prognosis, maybe they don't need neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but we have to prove that. In the luminal infiltrated, uh, uh, an immunotherapy drug. Uh, 
Basal squamous seems to be primed to respond to both um, checkpoint inhibitors and chemotherapy. Neuronal, as you'll see in just a minute, immunotherapy. So Roland Seiler, in a collaboration with Genome DX, and, and when he was a fellow with Peter Black in Vancouver, took two sets of retrospective cohorts. One was neoadjuvant chemotherapy, one was non-neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And you can see on the left, again, that the luminal papillary have a good outcome compared to the others. But in the neoadjuvant chemotherapy set, the basal squamous being primed to respond to chemotherapy has outcomes very similar to the favorable luminal uh, tumors. So this was quite interesting. And then we took a look with our, TC with our single patient classifier for the TCGA and showed something quite similar in this uh, data set from MD Anderson using dose dense MVAC. So we then published a paper, again led by Jagel Kim from the Brobe in European, Broad, uh, in European Urology, where we developed the single patient classifier and applied it to the MVIGOR 210 uh, uh, study with atezolizumab for patients with metastatic disease and found that neuronal tumors were exceptional responders to immunotherapy. Um, and uh, again, this might be, a this is a testable hypothesis uh, in this patient population. These just, they're the descriptions of the patients who had neuronal tumors. So in the PURE-1 neoadjuvant pembrolizumab uh, trial that was led by Andrea Necki, he showed that um, uh, Forty-two percent of patients had a pathologic complete response to pembrolizumab that went up to fifty-four percent in patients who were PDL1 uh, positive. And then he took a look at PDL1 and TMB or tumor mutation burden and found that uh, PT0 was achieved in uh, a higher percent of patients who were uh, PDL1 positive or had high TMB. And so these are other potential uh, biomarkers uh, for. Uh, prediction of response to immunotherapy. So um, in this setting of neoadjuvant pembrolizumab, he looked at um, molecular subtypes in this PURE-1 trial and showed uh, that basal squamous and luminal infiltrated appeared to be primed to respond the best in terms of overall complete response and partial response. And that just like we had shown in Invigor uh, 210, uh, that um, uh, the neuronal tumors had the worst uh, prognosis. So this is being, this was essentially confirmed that we had proposed in advanced tumors in this group of patients with locally advanced but not metastatic disease. So we have proposed a trial in SWOG, and we actually have funding to move this along. This is confidential, so please don't post this, of, of doing subtype-directed therapy. And in this trial, patients who are eligible for cisplatin-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy will get MRI and circulating tumor DNA, uh, and then have their tumor subtyped. And based upon whether or not they are luminal papillary basal or ni neither non-luminal papillary or basal, they'll get a randomization to neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus an experimental therapy that's targeted to that particular uh, subtype. They'll go on to get restaged with MRI and circulating tumor DNA, radical cystectomy, and the primary outcome measure is pathologic. Uh, complete response. We're very excited about this. This is a collaboration with Roche Genentech um, and the Clinical Trials Partnership within SWOG. So in summary, genomics and, pre and precision medicine, we know that about two-thirds of patients uh, with muscle-invasive bladder cancer have potentially actionable, mu actionable mutations. We know that targeted therapy has led to exceptional responders. I didn't show this, but the, the classic case was um, an mTOR inhibitor with a patient who had an alteration uh, that uh, led to a durable complete response when uh, this individual had not responded to other forms of therapy. We know that DNA damage repair gene alterations may confer exquisite sensitivity to cisplatin-based chemotherapy, and we think that expression subtypes will stratify survival probability in response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and potentially immunotherapy. We know that pembrolizumab is approved for patients with mismatch repair gene alterations, and TMB is associated with response to immunotherapy, and there have been people who have complete clearance, for instance, of upper tract uh, disease with mismatched repair gene alterations with pembrolizumab. We think that biomarkers can stratify risk across disease states, and we have to be very cognizant of the financial toxicity that requires precision medicine. So getting a full course of chemotherapy in a patient whose tumor is not primed to respond to that, they simply get exposed to risk without benefit. So the challenge moving forward is to identify the biomarkers and validate them in terms of 
response to treatment. And I'm very happy to say that a lot of this work is ongoing and uh, we're already beginning to see some exciting results. So thank you very much. And again, I want to thank you for this wonderful invitation and opportunity and I hope to see you next year.